Hi, welcome to another edition of Down and Dirty with Gardener Jim Martin. Today's segment, we're going to talk about natural ways that we can control pests and diseases in the garden. I'm excited to have Carrie Whitley here. She's one of my favorite professional horticulturists. And Carrie uh, has a specialty that makes it totally appropriate for her to be here today for this segment. Carrie, tell us a little bit about what you do, how you got into it. It's, it's kind of one of those uh, sort of strange things in some ways to be so involved in this. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm a plant pathologist and no one knows what that is. But what it is, what it means is that I go into people's gardens that are having problems with their plants and I teach them how to correct those problems and prevent future problems from happening. Now it's time to dish the dirt. And today's tool of choice the fingers. <laughs> yes, you know, it's one of those cheap and easy things that we have to use that is very useful in the garden. So Carrie, tell us, how are the fingers useful in, in the garden? In pest control? In pest control. Well, because some of these insects are so big and slow that it's just easier to pick them off your plants and remove them that way. And it, you know, it beats the heck out of having to go out and spray something that's not good for the environment. I couldn't agree more. And then at the end, it's just as easy for me to spend a little bit of time down here looking for them. Oh, look what I found over here, but not, not actually. I mean, there's no, your, there's no pest right now. Perfect. Yes, this time of year, everything's uh, wonderful. So when you start talking about pests and diseases in the garden, one of the things that's probably the most important thing to start talking about is proper soil preparation and how do you keep a healthy soil because healthy soil is probably the number one thing that keeps certain insect pests away. I agree and diseases too. Um, it has to be a, a well draining soil. I think that's the most important thing. Is In this area we have um, certain soils that don't drain very well and vegetable crops just will not grow if it's not good well drained. Which you notice here what we did with the raised beds is we've done exactly that. By raising it up 36 inches or you know between 12 and 36 inches we've got really good drainage here so we never have to worry about that and in fact this garden floods um, six seven times a year. Oh really? Yes yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I, I, I did the garden this way. Gone ahead and dug this compost in and done what we're supposed to to prepare the soil and, and we do this on a regular basis so what is the big deal with doing this? Well, I like to think of it as just natural pest control. The soil is the most important thing you can do to prepare for your vegetable garden. And this, a healthy soil like this actually will ward off pests and diseases. We, you know, it means work to like put this compost in on a regular basis. It's a lot of work on the front end. But the yield you'll have will be so much better and the amount of pesticides that you'll have to use are so much less. And you'll actually enjoy your garden a lot more through the season. And I... I think one of the things that we expect is that everything in the vegetable garden should be like going to a grocery store where we find perfect produce with no blemishes, um, nothing that, that appears to be wrong with it. But in reality, the garden in life isn't like that. And, it, and especially in a, a vegetable garden that's changing and evolving on a regular basis. And, and we see it with this broccoli plant right here, which we've got sort of different things going on with it. But in essence, we still have the broccoli that we can eat. We still do, and it looks great. And you're right, it's a little bit past its prime. Because once the broccoli starts to go to flower, we know that, that it's about time to pull it up. But one of the things I think you point out so well is that it doesn't have to be perfect, and it won't be perfect. And so a little bit of leaf spot, as long as your fruit or vegetable is healthy, a little bit of a blemish is an okay thing. So I've had it pointed out to me that um, I've been bad in the garden here, and so Carrie's going to tell me exactly why. Well, this is one of the biggest mistakes I see everywhere. Homeowners, greenhouses, you name it. And that is... Even in Jim Martin's little garden Even here. in Jim's little oh, perfect God. paradise. I know. It's shocking, y'all. <laughs> I've outed the, the director. Um, you know, when you pull something out of your garden, a lot of times it's because it has diseases or insects or it's past its prime. And it's important to take this and compost it, but you don't need to leave it right next to your next crop of plants. Because right. what happens is this becomes kind of a safe haven. We talked about healthy plants have less disease and insect problems, so decomposing plants actually attract them. So what you've got here is a situation where 
your insects and disease issues will go right back into your garden. So the best thing to do is to clean this up at the end of the day, get it to your compost bin and break it down. So one of the best ways to control pests and disease in your garden is to actually know that you have them, find out that they're there early on so that you can figure out ways to take care of them that would be natural ways of doing that. And, and here's a perfect example, and, and it's something that, you know, you have a business called Scout, and so... Yeah, and people always ask me what that means, and Scout is named for what I actually do, which is scouting, and I actually go through people's crops or their, their gardens and I look for pests and disease problems. So give, give me an example of what you do with well, like the Swiss chard. Like with this, you can't just look at it from above. You've got to actually look underneath the leaves because insects want to be where they're protected from the wind and the mm -hmm. sun and the rain. And so they use the undersides of the leaves as shelter. And I think that's something you have to really get down and see. I always say to people, I like it when they have to hand weed a little bit or hand water because it puts you right with your plants and you can actually see it very often and you know that that whole idea of hand watering mm -hmm. it's been my mantra for uh, forever and I've always said to people it's therapeutic for me but at the same time it gives me a chance to see what's going on in the garden it's kind of your quiet time with the garden so that you really know your plants it is it's spring and the weather's starting to warm up and we're thinking about some of those what we call warm season crops these would be things like squash and corn and and tomatoes for example mm -hmm. and so today we're going to talk about tomatoes and and one of the what, what's one of the biggest problems with tomatoes that we have in the south i would say that the thing i run into most is fusarium wilt. fusarium wilt. yeah and that's you know that you've got it because you've been watering your plant regularly but then you walk out one day and the entire plant has just wilted. You may have a gorgeous plant one day and the next day. It's and which is very strange. I mean, it's when you frustrating. think of it, you've got a beautiful plant here. It's been growing all season. Then one day you walk out and poof, it looks like it needs water. Right, and you've checked the, you check the soil and it's wet. So, so what is fusarium? Good, that's a good indication you got it. Fusarium is actually a fungus, and it gets into this main stem and clogs it up, just like plumbing getting clogged. That's what happens, and it keeps water from being able to get from the roots to the tips. So it will. And when you have fusarium in your soil, what, what, what do you need to do? Well, know that once you have fusarium in your soil, it's probably there forever. And so you can't fight it. There are no, no fungicides you can put in the soil or anything like that. So basically, you can't plant tomatoes there again. You need to, do, you need to put them somewhere else. So as far as what we can do to keep fusarium away, what are some different things that we can do? Like crop rotation. Crop rotation. That's Which the, is what? That's the biggest one. So if you planted your tomatoes in an area one year, you would move it to another next year. So while you can grow your tomatoes in this raised bed this year, I'd move it to a different location next, next year. year. And that just keeps the fungus from being able to build up in that soil. You take the food source away, and so it goes away. All right, so we're going we're gonna to plant these tomatoes, and a few little tidbits to, re to remember. If you're buying a transplant like we did here, mm -hmm. then w this peat pot that it's been grown in, we're going to go ahead and basically remove that mm -hmm. and the reason being is what well what I've found is this this edge this peat edge and once you plant it if it sticks up out of the soil at all it acts like a wick and will draw moisture from the soil and so your plant will dry out faster if you leave it on there so I would break it up and put it into the compost pile so I've uh, and you notice with the roots here these are it's just starting to grow in so there's no need for us to break it up any so we're going to be planting it at the right little height there, just a little bit lower than what it was growing in. Yeah, that's something that's interesting about tomatoes is usually we tell everybody to plant things high, but with the tomato, they like having that lower stem covered up a little bit. It'll make for a, a stronger plant. So you're invited into the inner sanctum and things are not perfect. And we have a, a citrus, this is one of our limes, and the poor thing has some problems, right, Carrie? <laughs> it does, it does. And this is why scouting regularly is so important. Because you don't want to catch it at this stage. You want to get it when it's this early. Stage. <laughs> well, I mean, look at the leaves. They're so yellow. When you get this kind of speckling on the leaves like this, it means that insects have been feeding on it for a long time. Right. And it's not healthy. So it's stressful on the plant. So I've left it go too long. Mm -hmm. 
and now I need to decide what I'm going to do about it. So, if, you know, what what are some of the ways I could control it? If you caught it early, I would say using something gentle like a really lightweight oil that they sell in garden centers for um, a horticultural soap, neem oil. There are lots of good organic ways to treat this. And since it's a fruit crop, it's even more important that you use an organic, gentle product. Right. So the, these um, limes are going to go back out, lemons and limes. Mm -hmm. At, from the greenhouse, they'll go out into the garden, and so what I usually do, because to tell you the truth, this, this isn't the first time this has happened, <laughs> they always look this bad when I take them out, um, is I'm going to cut them completely back so that um, they're, they're, it'll just be a, a, a mound of foliage up top, mm -hmm. or of, of sticks. And, and that's really the best way to ensure that you don't have the pest, is to actually completely remove get it rid from of the it. plant. So it, sometimes it's just too hard to, to get into a routine of spraying. And it's easier just to remove it once you have it. So I want to thank you, Carrie, for joining us today for another segment of Down and Dirty. Before we leave, let's talk about those three things that we want to remind everybody to do in the garden on a regular basis. Well, I'd say my number one tip is to make sure that you're scouting regularly and that you're looking for these pests and diseases so that you kind of know where you are with, your, with the needs of your garden. And the second one? Good soil. Good soil, absolutely. It starts with the soil. There's just no way you can have a healthy garden without it. And the third, which <laughs> we've already had brought to my attention, is you've got to take, you've got to clean your garden up regularly. You can see the disease on this plant. That's um, that's a good indication. The rotting can, cabbage. It's rotting head. cabbage, and all of that can spread throughout your garden. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. Check out our website at charlestonparksconservancy.org. Mm -hmm. Learn a little bit more about what we're doing in the garden this time of year, and happy gardening. <laughs>